Anyway, I'm delighted to be the first kickoff speaker for the semester. Um, it's been a while since I've talked in this series. And as you heard, I, I kind of consider myself primarily a global girl. But um, when I first got here in 2008, I, you know, I really wanted to also have a, a local project, what I call my hyper-local project. And I started looking around at what's possible in the Shinnecock Bay area because Stony Brook, well, it's not only an interesting place, but Stony Brook's Marine Station is based right on Shinnecock Bay. And we have a state-of-the-art marine lab there. We have a fleet of research vessels there. And it's a great place to think about working. So um, I'm going to give you a quick run through of what I've been doing there for the last 10 years in collaboration with lots and lots of other scientists. So Shinnecock Bay is on the south shore, southeast shore of Long Island. It is a regionally important habitat for um, fish, shellfish, and waterfowl. It's a shallow water bay and the water has a long residence time. And also it has high eutrophication vulnerability. So um, these are some of the characteristics. A lot of the people in this room, the people who've been at Stony Brook for a while probably have at least been there if not actually worked there too. So some of this will be hyper familiar to some. And for the new students, um, you probably have never been there yet. Okay, so when I got to Stony Brook in 2008 and started poking around Shinnecock Bay, what I learned from my colleagues is that for decades, there had been annually occurring harmful algal blooms, particularly brown tides. And brown tides actually do make the water look brown, like this. It it's kind of feels like you've taken a cup of coffee and, and thrown it all over the bay. Um, there was a severe loss of seagrasses at that time. The clam population, which had been really important, both um, biologically, but especially economically, there was a huge clam fishery out here, had collapsed. And as a whole, the, the ecosystem was pretty degraded. What really scared me, you know, so I was scared enough by these brown tides, but what really scared me was when I started to see while I was here that we were starting to get red tides occurring in Shinnecock Bay. And in, in for several years, uh, 2011, 2014, 2015, half of Shinnecock Bay had to be closed because of concerns about paralytic shellfish poisoning. Um, for those of you who don't know it, red tides can cause paralytic shellfish poisoning, which can cause temporary or permanent brain damage and can be fatal to humans. So we're not just talking about something like brown tides, which are unsightly and do impact a lot of the wildlife in Shinnecock Bay, but now we're talking about something that really could have a big impact on our own health. Looking at this New York State seagrass report, um, you know, basically Shinnecock Bay wasn't all that different from other places in New York. A lot of seagrass had been lost there by 20, 2009, compared to 1930, there was a 90% decrease in the amount of area covered by seagrasses in New York State. And there was a prediction made in this report that seagrass would be extinct by 2030. That's not very far away from now. And, and just going back a second, a lot of the reason for that was increased nitrogen loading into the water, which was fueling these brown tides. Brown tides were so brown, so thick, and the duration was increasing, and it did not allow sunlight to penetrate through the water. And as you know, all plants, whether they're aquatic or other, or nearly all plants, I should say, require sunlight in order to thrive and to grow. What caused the big shellfish decline in Shinnecock Bay? There were a variety of things that co-conspired to make this happen. Um, Overharvesting was a big one. The, the regulations weren't strong enough or um, I guess regulated well enough. And so a lot of overharvesting occurred. 
the habitat for shellfish was destroyed. The poor water quality definitely impacted the shellfish. So this is not a pretty scene. And a lot of the bad stuff had been documented, again, by my colleagues who had been here for a long, long time. And you know, we put our heads together and said, it's time to go from documenting the problem to see if we can actually try to fix it. And we tried for a few years to raise some substantial money to start a restoration program. It took a while for a bunch of reasons, but in 2012, we were really blessed with a major grant that enabled us to start and have confidence that we would be able to make a dent in the problem, what we've called the Shinnecock Bay Restoration Program. And as the Dean said, <laughs> The heart of the restoration strategy are what we call these hard clam sanctuaries. And why are they called sanctuaries? Because they are no take zones. And a lot of people ask me, how did you get this done? Didn't the fishermen complain about this? And in fact, things were so scary in Shinnecock Bay that no matter what walk of life you came from, you wanted, you knew things were bad and that they had to get better. And it was actually the Southampton town trustees, the Bayman, who said, absolutely, if we create these hard clam sanctuaries, we will not only make them off limits to fishing, we'll patrol the waters and make sure that no one is breaking the rules. So what are these hard clam sanctuaries? What we did was plant adult sized clams bigger than the size where we would expect predation to be a problem for them. And we had to plant them in large densities because clams have external fertilization. So you need to have them close together in order for that to be successful. And, um, and, these, and by, by using adult clams that were already at a size and an age where they could be reproductive, reproductively active, we knew that we could, we actually had to purchase these clams, by the way, on our grant um, to get clams that size, you really had to spend some money. And we calculated that we needed 33 million of these clams <laughs> in order to, um, in order to do what we, what we hoped would happen to the water quality in the Bay. There was no way we could afford to buy 33 million clams. So what we hoped is that the clams we put in the hard clam sanctuaries would not only survive, but they would reproduce, they would make baby clams, the baby clams would grow up and make more baby clams. And that through this process, we would eventually build up to um, a population that was 33 million bivalves in the Bay. So clams are very good at um, helping to restore the natural filtration capacity of the Bay. This was a, this was a solution that could be put into effect immediately Unlike other potential solutions like building sewage treatment plants and you know changing the whole infrastructure in, in the eastern end of Long Island, which really wasn't built that way. So it was something we could do right away. And we focused the clam sanctuaries in the western part of Shinnecock Bay because that was more degraded than the eastern part of Shinnecock Bay. Um, also for reasons having to do with the hydrodynamics in the bay, that the offspring of the of clams in the Western Bay would be expected to move towards the Eastern Bay, which was still going to be open to clam fishing, even though at the time we started this, there weren't any clams, any significant numbers of clams to fish. Okay, so. That's the idea of hard clam sanctuaries. It's analogous to marine protected areas, except it's in an estuarine environment where you set aside an area and do not allow any take. Initially, we also were hoping that we could build some oyster reefs in Shinnecock Bay. Um, we were not able to get permits to do that for about five years. And there was concern about building something that could impact navigation, that would be a permanent structure, blah, blah, blah. But eventually we did get permission and we've now also built seven oyster reefs in Shinnecock Bay. And then eelgrass, um, we found the most effective way in Shinnecock Bay 
to restore the eelgrass is to actually collect the seeds and spread them. And we had we held uh, community events pretty much annually where we brought in the community to help do the work of stripping the eelgrass of the seeds and helping to put them out. So as you've already heard from the Dean, <laughs> um, 10 years later, actually before 10 years later, we started to see, it, it took quite a while though. I mean, this was a slow gradual process, but we, we were seeing gradual changes over time, positive improvements. But within, within, I would say, seven, five, seven years, it looked like this is going to be a success. And within 10 years, it was clear it was a success. The clam population now uh, outside the, the hard clam sanctuaries and the fishery for hard clams is now uh, back to where it was in the mid-1970s. So way before this decline. And it's not only good for the environment, it's been really good for the economy. Everyone is happy. Then we saw, uh, you know, as I said, we saw some things with brown tides. We saw that, oh, you know, of course this is a bumpy graph. It's not, it's not a straight line, but we started to see between 2008 and 2017, in general, um, there were fewer brown tide cells per milliliter and the duration of the brown tides, which had gone to extend over months in the summer, started to take place for shorter and shorter and shorter periods of time. And since 2018, we have not seen any significant brown tide. And we pretty much consider that, at least for now, we have eradicated the brown tide. So Shinnecock Bay went from looking something like this in late spring, early summer. And this is what it looks like today at that time. We actually did turn brown tide blue. One of our proudest achievements. And now Shinnecock Bay stands as a beacon of hope, not only to the local community and to New York State, but to a global community that with good science, with perseverance, with adaptation, with hard work, we are able to turn around and fix some of the problems that we as humans have caused. And a lot of the science of this part of the story is published in this article that came out in 2022 by our team. So I want to go and move on to what about the rest of the creatures in the bay? You know, we talked a lot about clams, oysters, eelgrass. We did direct interventions in Shinnecock Bay to put those back in the bay to create oyster reefs. But can we say anything about whether this restoration has had any impact on the higher trophic levels in the bay? What about the fish? What about the other invertebrates? And we had envisioned from the start and hopes that it would have an impact. So I'm gonna focus on that part of the story. So I've been leading the fish monitoring work since the start of this project. We've had uh, an amazing group of people working with us over the years. Many students have gotten their degrees working on this project. And for the most part, we have used bottom trawling as our primary assessment methodology. And those of you who've heard about bottom trawling, you may have heard bottom trawling is not such a good thing. Um, when you hear about the most destructive fishing practice in the world, it's bottom trawling. It's, it's pretty much uniformly regarded as that um, because bottom trawling can destroy the bottom habitat and it can also kill the organisms that it catches. In fishing, of course, you do want to kill those fish, I guess, is why you're doing it. But this method is not only used today for fishing, it's also one of the primary survey assessment methods that is used in the United States for fisheries assessment around the country and in many, many parts of the globe. The way we do bottom trawling is quite different from a big commercial operation. First, we use a very small net 
Secondly, we only trawl for three minutes at a time. And that seems like a very short amount of time, but it's sufficient for us to get the kind of data that we need. And we have found statistically significant results. So the fish that are caught haven't been subjected to long trawling times, and we take good care of them as soon as we bring them up. Um, this shows that you know the net comes up, the cod end, the end of the net is emptied into these bins. We sort the catch. What isn't shown here is that we have a lot of buckets of water and we take the fish, especially the ones that are particularly susceptible to being out of water, um, and we put them in the buckets so that they're okay. We weigh and measure the fish. And for some of these species, you can tell the sex of the fish visually. And we do that too. We've used, uh, to the extent possible, the same general locations to trawl. This is a standardized trawl survey over the years. We had to make some changes because the initial trawl trawl sites, um, some of them ended up becoming hard climb sanctuary sites. So we had to make some, some adjustments, but we do have very long-term data from the same general locations. We sample every other week in the summertime. Sometimes we started as early as April and gone as late as November. So it's, it's actually a long season for us. And some of you who aren't familiar with these bays might be really surprised at the kinds of life that we have in Shinnecock Bay. You know, how many of you would have thought that we have a native seahorse species in Shinnecock Bay? When you think about the South Shore, people don't usually think of seahorses. And when I mention it to people who are not in the know, they go, really? <laughs> it's exciting. We actually have um, on the bottom left here, we have a coral species that is not a reef building coral, but we actually have a coral, coral species that is prevalent in Shinnecock Bay. And we've got a high diversity of fishes. We've, um, We've seen more than 100 species of fishes during the 10, 11 years that we've been working in the bay. Everything, well, you know, we'll talk more about it, but everything from recreationally and commercially important species to species that are important in the food web to sharks. So looking at the long-term trawl data series, we decided to look at it in two different ways. One is, we knew, we expected that, um, well, we knew from the beginning that the eastern part of the bay in the lighter color, greenish blue, what the water quality initially was higher and the diversity was higher than in the western part of the bay, which is the darker color. And what's the main reason for that? It's because of this hard to see inlet, the Shinnecock Inlet, which connects Shinnecock Bay to the Atlantic Ocean. And because of that, water from the Atlantic Ocean is able to come in and mix the water. Um, and eventually it does get all the way around, but it does a much better job close by in the Eastern part of the Bay. So we thought if, the, if we could detect a difference over time in how similar the Western part of the Bay looks to the Eastern part of the Bay, that would be a measure of success, some measure of success that we're having an impact on the fish community. And we looked at, this is just one, gra one graph, um, west, east, west minus east, catch per unit effort anomalies. And over time, this is what the data series looks like. Um, blue is fish, orange are invertebrates, and all species combined are in gray. And what we found is that um, the fish was, the fish differences were not statistically significant, but I think they're getting close. Invertebrates were, and all species combined were, that there has been basically that, in fact, the Western Bay is starting to look more and more like the Eastern Bay over time. Some individual species, we got statistically significant results for an, an, an actual transition from east to west being more similar. Those include Atlantic surf silversides, weakfish, 
common, common spider crabs, green crabs, and mantis shrubs. So there's some evidence from that type of work. This is, this is a recent um, pie chart of what the diversity looks like for fish in the eastern and western parts of the bay. And you can see that in general, the east is still, um, there's, there's higher biodiversity, there are more species, a higher number of species. And if you look at the evenness, the distribution of individuals with, among species, much more even in the east, which is on the left side of this graph than it is in the west, where you tend to see domination by just um, a couple, three species and fewer species overall. This is for invertebrates, same idea. Um, there's not as much difference between East and West today in, in invertebrate species diversity. Um, both areas are dominated by a couple of species and there are many fewer species of invertebrates in the bay than there are fish. Um, we haven't seen any significant trend in species diversity for either fish or invertebrates over the time series, but we do see, again, this huge difference in diversity with fish being much more diverse than invertebrates. Okay, the other thing that we hoped would eventually work would be to look at the catch per unit effort, which is an index of relative abundance of species over the whole time series, and to see, do we find significant trends? And we do <laughs> for the fish population. Um, I'll show more of the statistics in just a bit. For the invertebrates, we do not see any change over this, this is an 11 year time period, 20, 2012 to 2022. Sorry for how complicated this graph looks, but um, the, the, purple bar, the purple boundary and the bar are all fish, all species combined. And you can see that there is a, a tendency for an increase overall, total fish we call that, and the p-value, for that is 0.02, so it is a significant trend. We also put these bars in here, the histograms, to show that the dominant species that have shown this increase are what we call forage fish. And some of these fish, individual species, so forage fish as a group, are there's a statistical statistically significant increase. Um, also, some individual species, Atlantic Manhattan and Atlantic Silverside, um, also have a statistically significant increase over this time period. And why are they called forage fish? It's because everything else in the ecosystem forages upon them. They are food. They're able to feed on plankton. Not a lot of fish species can do that. And so other fish seabirds, marine mammals, feed on the forage fish. Now we see whales, humpback whales all the time off the coast of Shinnecock Bay. Didn't used to see very many before, feeding on schools of menhaden and other forage fish. So there are low trophic level species and they're critically important and play a, a special role in marine ecosystems and estuarine ecosystems. So this, um, this was kind of like the money graph, I would say, and showing that there has been a significant increase, at least in the forage species. When we compared, when we looked around to see where specifically there was the greatest increase, it was in the Western part of Shinnecock Bay, which had been so degraded and so depauperate of fish at the beginning. And in Western Shinnecock Bay, we saw more than a fourfold increase in catch period of effort, um, highly statistically significant. So looking at this, this is again, the full time series catch per unit effort. Um, I've talked about Atlantic Menhaden, Atlantic Silverside, weak fish also showed a statistically significant increasing trend. There were some interesting things we saw for the invertebrates. Um, some positive news is that the horseshoe crabs increased in abundance. And I actually have seen 
more and more molts of horseshoe crabs left on the shore in the last few years than I had been seeing for a really long time. And I, and I know a lot of people in the community would say, what happened to the horseshoe crabs? We used to see all these molts. And for a while, they were few and far between, but now we do see more and the data back up that there really are more horseshoe crabs in Shinnecock Bay these days. Um, green crab shows a significant decrease. Green crab is an invasive species doesn't belong here. It's been called one of the top 100 worst invasive species on the planet. Um, it can do an awful lot of damage. And lucky for us, green crabs have greatly declined in abundance in Shinnecock Bay. So let's talk a little bit about eDNA. We started out with trawling and we are continuing the trawling because it is a standardized long-term database and a very rich database. And we started exploring eDNA um, just in the past four years. So what eDNA is, the E stands for environmental. And it means that this is DNA that is in the environment, in this case, left in the water by the organisms that live within that water through secretions of the organisms, through slough skin cells, through scales falling off of fish, and fragments of DNA are left in the water. And just from a water sample, we can tell an awful lot about the species diversity in an area. Um, I, I was fortunate to be able to publish this piece in Science in 2018, where I did a literature review on the use of eDNA and its potential in marine ecosystems. At that point in time, while eDNA had been used in other types of systems, there were very few papers where people had looked at it within marine or estuarine systems. And I got really excited by what I learned. The title that science wanted to give to this was that eDNA is a tool for finding rare marine species, and it is a superb tool for finding things that are very, very rare. Um, but actually, as I'll show more later on, it's also a great tool for detecting common species, not just rare species. So in this paper, I, I outline exactly why I think eDNA outperforms other, other survey methods. It's a non-invasive technique, non-destructive of species or habitat. It's more powerful at detecting species. Importantly, it can sample the entire size spectrum of organisms in the environment. So something as big as a whale shark or a blue whale, that would never get caught in a trawl, right? <laughs> and um, really tiny things would go right through the mesh of a trawl net. So typical sampling through bottom trawling, misses the little things and the big things. eDNA can find anything, the full size spectrum of life. It can also be used in these really sensitive habitats. You know, we found ourselves having to move our trolling out of areas because we made them into hard climb sanctuaries and oyster reefs. And no problem, we can take water samples there. Um, so it's enabling us to continue to monitor the ecosystem in even very sensitive habitats. It's a lot less labor intensive and has a smaller carbon footprint. So um, right now our technique for collecting the samples is pretty primitive. <laughs> we um, basically take this long pole and a bottle that's been sterilized, rinse it in situ a few times, pull it out, close it up, put it on ice and rush it to Gordon Taylor's lab. Gordon, I want to give a big shout out to. He has been very generous with us in allowing us to use his lab. And the samples go through a period, a number of different steps. And in the end, we get a whole bunch of data. The data are DNA sequences, which because there is now a better and better library of DNA sequences of organisms in the, in the Northeast and in lots of other parts of the world, we can find out what species they are. We also get sequence counts, which may have a relationship to abundance. 
So here are some of the things that we've learned. This is like, again, it's a quick, quick overview. Um, you know, this points out that eDNA does catch or does detect um, both common and rare species. So to read this graph, the blue bars are individual years that a species was seen in a trawl net. And this is the number of years that we had sampled at that point. So there are, this group of species are species that we've seen every year in trawls. And these three years are detections by eDNA. And we can see that those same species, the regulars that we've seen every single year, are also detected every single year by eDNA. So it's good for looking at common species, regular species, as well as rare. Coming out here, it might be a little bit difficult to parse this out by sight quickly, but there are more red, kind of gold, and, and yellow bars out here, species that were only detected once, than there are blue. So again, it's telling us that eDNA is better at detecting rare species. We found species with eDNA that we had not ever seen before. Um, these are some of the important, recreationally important and commercially important species. And um, this was a focus of one of my MCP students this summer's project. Allie Gallagher put this together. And again, we see that for the four species that were seen in all years, eDNA and trolls both detected all of those species in every year. And these are the four species. I'm not going to go into life history, but it's going to be important background for the next phase of what we hope to do. What eDNA did for us in terms of elasmobranch diversity was really remarkable. Before we started using uh, DNA, eDNA, we only had found three species of elasmobranchs in trawl, but through trawling. And when we started using eDNA, we found four species that were only found by eDNA um, that had not been found. So four additional species, including sand tiger sharks, which we always, you know, we had heard anecdotal stories that they were there, but we'd never seen one in a trawl. Short fin mako sharks, cow nose rays, and little skates. So in one season of sampling, we increased our biodiversity estimate of the lesser banks by 133%. <laughs> that's a, you know, that's a pretty big impact of just a little bit of sampling. You can get a lot of data from a little bit of work. We also found that most of the samples contained elasmobranch DNA and smooth dogfish, which we did catch in trawls, but rarely were found in all the samples. We also found seven species through eDNA that were unique to restoration areas. So this is a good sign that the restoration areas are drawing in species that weren't coming here before. And here are those seven species. It may surprise some of you that there are tropical species in this group, but this is something that's been seen for a long time that in, in the late summer, early fall, as the Gulf Stream brings up warmer water, tropical species do tend to come into Shinnecock Bay. So to sum up the eDNA lessons, eDNA has uncovered a very broad spectrum of biodiversity detecting more species than our trawls, while also finding most of the species we've seen in our trawls. Um, what we're hoping to do is to extend the eDNA research to other trophic groups, other types of species, including marine mammals, sea turtles, and seabirds. We're in conversations now with groups that specialize in those types of organisms to see if we can get a collaboration going. We want to get an entire ecosystem perspective on Chinookock Bay. Again, eDNA can be used in the sensitive habitats where other methodologies can't be employed. eDNA also helped us to realize that we had been making mistakes in some of our visual identifications of fish. You know, we have keys on board, um, you know, keys to help us identify fish and, you know, a lot of experience. 
And of course, we always have Chris Paparo who we can text photos of and say, what is this? But when we started looking at the eDNA, we realized that we'd been making some mistakes through our visual identification and that it was a closely related species, but not the species we thought in some cases. Okay, and again, emphasizing cost-effective, less labor-intensive, and a smaller carbon footprint than trawling. So I think the message I'm, I'm getting here is not just that this is a great technique for Shinnecock Bay, but something we really need to be looking at more broadly in ocean observing as one of the primary methods that we use and develop as time goes forward. So what's the answer to my question? Can we conclude that direct restoration of hard clams, eelgrass, and oysters has improved the fish and invertebrate communities of Shinnecock Bay? I'll try to go very quickly through this so we have time for questions. I say yes, the answer is, it seems to be yes. We're seeing this growing fish abundance, um, three to four folds from 2012 to 2022. In the east versus west comparisons, the western and eastern bays are looking more and more sim similar. The fish, CPUE in general, uh, increased very strongly in western Shinnecock Bay. The restoration sites found seven species we hadn't ever seen before. Forage fish, such as menhaden shown here, quadrupled in abundance. So beyond these forage fish, um, when will we start to see the higher trophic levels really start to show that they are also improving? And we always expected that it would take longer for that to happen because in order for that to happen, their food has to increase first, right? So the forage species had to increase first in order for the higher trophic level species to start increasing. Also, the big fish, the marine mammals, the seabirds, they have different life histories, slower life histories, we call it, where they reach maturity later. So their generation times are a lot longer. It's going to take time to see changes. One of the things that we're embarking on beginning this year, and at least one of my new students is in the room, I believe, Yifan, are you here? There he is in the back. And we're, we're working collaboratively with Young Chen's lab to develop an ecosystem model to not only be able to predict when the higher trophic levels might change, but also to consider climate change and the impact that that is gonna have on the expected progression of this ecosystem. So after 10 years, it was clear the restoration succeeded. Brown tides eradicated, clam population flourishing, seagrasses, a major comeback, fish and wildlife thriving, and people can enjoy a safe and healthy environment in Shinnecock Bay. And so um, I did, through the Institute for Ocean Conservation Science, with the Explorers Club as a second nominator, nominated Shinnecock Bay to be considered by Mission Blue as a hope spot. And in 2022, Mission Blue did decide, yes, Shinnecock Bay deserves to be a hope spot because it brings, you know, it's a beacon of hope showing that we can undo the damage that's been done elsewhere. And this now elevates Shinnecock Bay beyond the hyper-local, beyond the local scene, to now it's one of these, it's becoming a global example that is getting a lot of attention um, on, on the fact that we, we should have hope, we should try to fix things. There are places where we can fix things. Puts it in the same league as places, iconic ecosystems like the Galapagos, the Ross Sea in Antarctica, the Sargasso Sea. These are other examples of hope spots which currently number about 150 around the world. And it's the first hope spot in the state of New York. So we've gotten press extending from the hyperlocal to the global. Um, Southampton Press has covered this several times on the front page. This, um, this last June, I was invited to present on this at the United Nations during a diplomat scientist exchange that occurs in June during World Ocean Week. And the press picked this up, picked up the conversation and wrote an extensive article and, and there was an NPR story also where global leaders agree, UN leaders say 
Shinnecote Bay is a model for ocean conservation globally. So they're agreeing with Mission Blue. Um, we've also gotten attention on TV. There was a big series. A number of you were involved in this series that NBC News um, put together last year. And the Shinnecott Bay Global Hope Spot was one of the things that was featured in that. And then this year um, on June, oh, I forget the date now. I should remember it. Basically the day after World Ocean Day, um, we had an official ribbon cutting ceremony. And here's Sylvia Earl. Here's here's our dean in the back. In the back. Um, to officially inaugurate Shinnecock Bay as a hope spot. And we have people here from a variety of walks of life. This is Richard Garia, he's president of the Explorers Club. This person is a Southampton Town trustee and a bayman, Ed Warner. He's been a huge help to the project from the very beginning. He was one of the people who said, sure, we'll close down these sanctuaries to fishing and we'll patrol it. So he was there. We all know Chris Gobler, Kelsey Leonard from the Shinnecock Indian Nation. They wrote um, in support of the Hope Spot designation and are active collaborators. And then there are a bunch of people who are either developing new tech, or in this case, this is Erica Schmidt Montague. Um, she is program officer for Schmidt Marine Technology Partners. And Schmidt Marine Technology Partners was very helpful to us this year. They provided us with demos on ways that we could go from our very simple method of collecting DNA and analyzing DNA to ways that we could make it more um, basically autonomous and in situ. And they brought with them four different technologies and two of them were donated to us at Stony Brook University. So major goals going forward, we need to keep monitoring the Bay Hill. Additional restoration is planned. Saying that that Shinnecock Bay is a great test bed for new science and having the demonstrations of the technology this last summer really helps with that too. Um, it is because we've got such a wealth of information here and in all different areas of science. So it's a great place to test new innovative techniques and to provide proof of concept, which then we hope would help to get these technologies employed elsewhere. In enhancing engagement with stakeholders, broad inclusive participation and partners, spreading the word locally and globally. Um, this pretty much says the same thing I just said. 2024 is gonna be a really big year for us. Um, we're having a major expedition and we are going to start looking at marine mammals and seabirds in addition to the other species group. We are partnering with the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We have, we have an agreement to collaborate and resources to foster that collaboration. We're gonna cover all waters in the land and sky of Shinnecock Bay and employ some of these new and emerging technologies, including eDNA sensors that can be used in situ. So many, many thanks to so many people these are the main um, main people who have been involved in the project pretty much since its beginning. But there are a lot more people to thank. And I, I hope I got most of them on this last slide. And that's my talk. Thank you. So there's a little bit of time, right? Questions. So before I ask my question, uh, I went fishing in Chinnacock Bay a few weeks ago with my buddies like Oregon and John Walden. We got a lot of keepers. What should happen all around us? So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> here's my I love, I love stories like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and thank goodness, I prefer to go back to. Uh, so here's my question. Uh, 
It's more of a, 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 a question of institutions in this region. And I'm wondering if any policy changes of organizations like the DEC or regional fisheries like federal have helped in, the, in any way to in, in, in enable this increase? And if not, what do you think they should be doing? That's that's a really good question. So um, there, ha there hasn't been as much cooperation uh, or help or support as we've thought. One of, one of the issues that I keep hearing is that the bays on the on the eastern shore of Long Island are kind of not managed by the state, and that's one of the reasons. Um, the DEC was the, the organization we needed to get permits to build oyster reefs, and they were dead set against giving us permission for five years, and then had a change of heart and allowed us to do it. So, um, I mean, but the DEC does manage fisheries up and down the coast. You know, one of the obvious complexities here is um, that a lot of these species that reside in the bay also go offshore and they're recreationally important and commercially important. So we're going to work on that. And Christine Santara has something to add on that. Just has to, something to, to add. In a perspective on the DEC. So the DEC has been uh, very generous in recognizing Chinook Bay restoration as a model for other restoration in New York State. Uh, I'm not sure that every restoration ever can um, implement the level of science and monitoring that we have done. Um, but that's a separate story. But it, it does lead into the fact that the DEC is very involved in leading a, shell, a, a management planning process for shellfish all around New York State uh, so that things aren't being done ad hoc all over the place. And there's a set of best practices, um, a set of questions each restoration effort should be asking. Um, different protocols that we've used are being integrated into this plan so that other people interested in doing this kind of restoration can look to this plan of best practices um, so that they can, you know, we can have a more standardized way of doing things in New York. So the DEC has been, I think, at the latter end of the project in the past, like, two years or so, really involved in this um, statewide um, standardization of how we might do shellfish monitoring uh, around New York City. So that's been a very positive uh, development. Thank yeah, you, Christine. I'm, I'm, I'm on that committee. and I'm, You are? I'm hopeful that something <laughs> will happen. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, horseshoe crab bait for example, is one thing that might change as it has in Connecticut. Yeah. That is, there's no, it's no longer collected for Bank of Connecticut. Yeah, I, I would like to, year. I would like to understand more about why we still allow that, you know, in so much of Long Island, why we allow horseshoe crabs to be ground up and used as bait when other places don't, but maybe you can educate me at another time. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, Let's do a couple of, yeah, yeah, I'll let, a couple I'll of let you. student questions, maybe. Yeah, students. she's a student. Okay. Yeah, so let's have the next two new student questions, maybe. Um, so uh, you said um, a lot of tropical fish go into Shanghai Bay. Have you seen an increase in that in recent years? Yeah, the, pro the problem is that, you know, that only happens for a short period of time. We haven't really seen it in our data yet and um, there doesn't seem to be long-term data on on that so we can look more carefully at the data we do have though. good question yeah so i have a question about the edna um and as you're probably familiar uh, a number of different fish species um have sort of an immense amount of these proteinous secretions um, sort of across their body that get slopped as they move through the water column, and especially with something with a lot of tidal variability, such as Chinacotic Bay, that sloughing can happen more, which I imagine could impact, um, impact the material that is collected by eDNA. Um, certainly, elasmobranchs and a lot of common elasmobranchs we see on the south short of Long Island have this as well. Um, so I wonder if there have been any studies or related studies to the eDNA in SHRP, um, seeing how much of an impact is this soft tissue that is getting moved in through the inlet and through the tidal activity as opposed to fish with actual residency in the bay. 
Yeah, really good question. Um, it's something that we definitely want to look into more. Um, but one thing I should say about eDNA in Shinnecock Bay and in marine environments is that it's very short lived. It's it degrades very quickly. Forty eight hours is considered to be an absolute maximum time that eDNA will persist in this environment. And during summers, during hot weather, it'll degrade even more quickly. So the idea that we're seeing eDNA that's been around for a long time isn't it's really not valid. valid. Um, it's a great technique for, for looking at what is here right now. So maybe that helps. The other thing is that I think what you're hinting at is different species are going to have different secretion rates. And so the amount of eDNA sequences of a species compared to another species may not reflect their relative abundance. I don't see that as a huge problem because the same thing is true of any assessment technique you use. If you go trawling, you're going to catch some species more highly selectively than others. And there are ways to adjust for that with data over time. We can do those same adjustments once we get more information about eDNA. Another method we use that I didn't talk about, um, but is, is a fun method to use and also non-destructive, non-invasive is jaded remote underwater video cameras. And that technique is so selective we get very few species because the only species that want to come and take the bait actually come in front of the camera. So all methods that you look at to try to figure out what's in the ocean and how much of it there, there is, they, they have limitations and they, they don't, not all species will be equally uh, detectable by different methods, but we can make adjustments for that. Um, how about you? Do you want to ask your question? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Alan, for a very interesting talk. Um, just a historical note and then a question. The historical note is, you know, Shinnecock Bay has suffered terrible water quality problems. And 125 years ago, it, it was um, considered so bad that they dug the canal from Oconic Bay into Shinnecock Bay to try and increase the water quality, but there was no Shinnecock Inlet. The inlet was broken through by a hurricane in 1938 right. called the Long Island Express. And so now suddenly that made a difference. So, but the thing about the canal that's interesting and unique maybe in the whole world is that it's got these locks and these aren't ordinary but ship locks. Mm -hmm. They will let water flow only one direction from Shinnecock, from Conic Bay and Shinnecock Bay. Right. It's like a pumping action. It's, some people would call it, a plum would call it a backflow preventer or a rectifier, but whatever. That's had a big effect on the hydrodynamics. But my question is about, I didn't hear you talk about coliform bacteria counts, because that's a sort of a basic way of measuring water quality. And the DEC uses it to, you know, uh, decertify water. So how? Are there maps that show the distribution of telecom counts? And has that changed over the last 10 years? Um, I don't know the answer to your question. Probably there are maps, and I'm sure that the, those data are being collected. It's not something that sure specifically we're not collecting that information because it's already being collected by other other agencies. Well, I know like Stony Brook Harbor, the DC used to do a monthly survey. I don't know if they still include maybe something you know that's the yeah. yeah, no, I mean I know that I think it's the DEC that is doing the sampling for the red tide, presence of red tide and making the decisions about whether to close part of the bay or not. So a bunch of these things are being measured by other entities. So we tried to do the things that weren't being measured by the other entities. And uh, probably someone else in the project could answer your question better than I can. I saw that maybe there were a couple more student questions. Yeah. Um, I don't know who was first. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so assuming higher trophic levels of species, uh, we get to frequent water in the ground to pop in uh, more often. Do you think there may be kind of consequences of conservation or restoration efforts given those and for increased interaction with it's having a lot of trolley stall in the way, et cetera. And how my existing technology policies influence those kind of things. 
Um, sure. I mean, I think that there, so as people start seeing more things that are scary, like some sharks that could actually attack people. I mean, basically, sand tiger sharks don't, they're, they're not likely to attack a person. Um, but um, yeah, I think that that could have, if people start getting bitten by sharks, it's going to make the news and kind of change the way people look at it. And on the other hand, if you start getting more fish that are of size that you can keep their keepers, that are recreational sizes, there could be more pressure on those populations and more pressure to open up areas and then close. Um, you know, good questions. You're thinking ahead. And I think that we will have to deal with those things as they can. Hi, let's have the last question. Oh, yeah, I just, um, so in general, about like the restoration and conservation projects, like looking back, um, I was just wondering, like, you know, because I think it took a lot of work and sometimes to see some like um, results. And I know you mentioned about like getting funding to start was a problem. But I was just wondering, like, looking back over the course of the um, project, like, what would be the like, challenge you had to overcome? Make sure that's what you there, there are so many stories that I could tell you. <laughs> um, you know, one that had a lot to do with Stony Brook University policy was that just around the time we decided to start looking for funding, the, the Stony Brook campus was shut down. You know, you remember that's happened several times over the course of history. That made a lot of people who had donated money to build the campus very unhappy and very unlikely to support anything that Stony Brook was going to do in Southampton. So that was really bad timing for us, and it did take a while to get people who were interested. And then the campus was reopened with a new model, which seems to be working pretty well. You know, we had a, we had a model for a while of sustainability science, where um, students were expected to get everything they needed for their entire degree completely in Southampton. Now the model is that we have semester by the sea. And students come from a semester, a semester, and get an immersive, deep experience. And they can be our own students or students from elsewhere. And that financial model seems to be keeping the place afloat and is and is working. So that was one challenge. Another challenge that I'll mention. Um, so we actually did get a donation at the beginning, a big donation of seed plants to kick off our restoration. And we thought this is great. Well, you know, because they're used in other places for shellfish restoration. <laughs> um, so we we put a whole bunch of seed plants, really small plants, in the water. We couldn't wait to see how they were doing. And we went diving um, you know, a few months afterwards, and they were all gone. They had all been eaten. And it was really depressing. You know, this idea that you could use inexpensive seed plants to restore Shinnecock Bay, it was just not, it was just not gonna work there. And that's when we realized we had to, we had to change our budget. We had to change our thinking. We, we were gonna have to buy big plants. We weren't gonna get donations of adult size clams. And so we, we had to think at our feet and we started, we did this event called Clams for Clams. <laughs> Which, uh, and at that point, the community was a little bit more receptive to helping things out. And uh, we, we raised money for these, for people to donate enough money to buy enough plants to create a hard plant sanctuary. And we named these sanctuaries for the people who did the donation, however they wanted it to be named, either after them or in honor of someone, a memory of someone. And that was how we ended up paying. I guess the big thing is that we all were really, really worried for a long time about whether we were doing something that was going to be fruitless, a lot of work, a lot of time and effort, and would not pay off. There were no guarantees that this was going to work. Absolutely no guarantees. And we worried about it quite a bit. But we, we went ahead and did it. And it did take several years before we started to see promising changes. So um, we're lucky that we were able to find that we were, you know, that we were willing to take the risk is one thing, that we were able to find people that were willing to support 
a risky project was you know really an incredible gift and it paid off more than any of us so those are some of the stories but there are a lot all right well thank you so much for, thank for you. coming and doing the podcast.